Good afternoon. Um, I also um, used to work for Dell Technologies, basically. I was working for a, on a large transformation program actually in Amsterdam for ING Bank, which is where some of my interest actually in this comes, because although we were primarily looking at building a private cloud for them, two of the things that we actually were looking at were blockchain and artificial intelligence to actually improve their organization. And what I wanted to do was take you through some of the arc this afternoon. We'll come back to basically what I think are some of the key points really in, around artificial intelligence and the applications later on. But I wanted to sort of bear this in what I think was probably the last you know, large transformation, uh, transformation we actually had, which was around the introduction of computing actually in the 1950s and the 60s. And this is the death set, which is actually in a very old film with Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. Spencer Tracy was actually the inventor of the computer system that was being introduced, and Hepburn was actually the, the head librarian. And effectively, the computer was supposed to replace all the librarians, basically, in the scenario. And of course, they actually had some slight issues. You know, they, they found that the computer system couldn't differentiate between Corfu, the Greek island, and, and Q, 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 Corfu, uh, curfew, you know, the time constraint. And we'll come back to that because I think you know, it's one of the key things is we're getting to the stage where the AI is actually can differentiate. But we also want to talk about some other aspects of this. Um, and also in the 1950s, this was Turing's basically paper which was published on the imitation game. Now the, the, this became, has become widely known as the Turing test and the idea was what he talked about was if you could interact with a system via teletype, remember this is very, very old, a you know, computer t keyboard in effect, and if you could ask the system at the other end a series of questions and you couldn't differentiate it between that and the human, then it actually, gem actually demonstrated general, general intelligence. Um, we, you know, the, the general acceptance is nothing, we don't have an AI that's actually passed this test. There's been one case where they actually simulated a young child and that actually managed to claim that that actually passed the Turing test. I think that's quite important as well. Um, 1950s actually was also quite interesting because this is where the concept of pe uh, perceptron actually came from, which we could figure it, or we could label as actually a single layer neural network. And actually led to actually quite a large delay and setback in the AI community. And I wanted to also just ground this actually in a definition of AI because basically this talks about um, around the fact that it's simulating some characteristics of the human. Principally, human visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, and language translation. I think we're already looking at basically a definition that is actually starting to become quite narrow. It's not really what Turing was perceiving as uh, general artificial intelligence in the 19, 1950s. Um, and the other thing to actually note is you're probably all aware that this is not a mathematical, it's not a statistical paradigm in machine learning. We, we're moving into an algorithmic space, which is also quite, quite important as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about, you know, someone alluded to this this morning. Basically, I think what the first talk, speaker was talking about the fact that AI is a huge space. I really just want to take you through, through an example really in machine learning and deep learning, which I think is really the more interesting space at the moment. Of course, um, you know, the big story around the deep learning has been really what DeepMind has actually done in the last decade, you know, where they've actually managed to come up with a deep neural, neural network that's actually beaten a Go master, which is a huge difference between that and what IBM were doing with Big Blue a few, you know, a decade or so ago. Um, and I'm not going to go into terms of the learning models around this at all. You know, this is really intended to actually provide you an introduction without some of the mass and the, deta and the detail in that. Um, I also wanted to talk about touch. You know, I said the 1950s, there was a big setback. The 1980s was probably where a lot of the foundation work was actually laid for this. We had the concept of um, expert systems coming in. And again, this turned out to be a false dawn. Now, I remember trying to implement one of these in the help desk system. All they were largely about was actually codification, basically, of um, decision trees. And the, the big problem with this is you needed to actually have expert to actually be able to describe this. And outside that decision tree, it actually had no intuitive capability at all. It was a very linear process. Um, but the 1980s was quite fundamental, to actually, to the AI. 
So this was the con this is the age where they actually moved away from simplification to actually effectively encoding the complexities through connections. Um, and this, you know, a lot of the foundational work for what we do at the moment, you know, around deep convolutional networks, was effectively found was actually demonstrated in the 1980s. Um, I'm, I'm using Chilliers, but you can there's plenty of other people you can quote around this. Um, and all the all the, the concept of back propagation in terms of training were actually generated around this time, <coughs> but it didn't actually lead to anything practical. Um, this is an Apple Newton. If no one actually recognises this, this is actually someone recognises it. And of course, this was introduced to a huge amount of fanfare, and this was supposed to be effectively the device of to enable you to actually write, you know, scribble on it, and it actually would detect it. Came out, and basically, it just did not actually go anywhere in the industry at the time. Um, it was canned by basically Jobs when he went back to Apple in 1998. Uh, I also had a friend who was actually at the time doing a PhD, and what he was doing using SVM's um, support vector machines to do classification and recognition, basically, of, of numerals. He came out having done his PhD, thinking actually he would like to continue that, and could find no one really in the UK actually looking at commercial opportunities of that. We really need to move forward another decade before we actually start to see, um, the real, start to see some of the realizations of this. And this is, one of the, I think, one of the key foundations that really what's happened in the last decade or so, which has actually moved, moved uh, machine learning on. Um, I've, I talk about this as around the commoditization. I've put this in, you know, I've, I've been using a Raspberry Pi to pay with, to pay with some of the machine learning frameworks. Um, you've now got Google have actually moved on to the third generation of the TPUs, the tensor processor units. These are actually up around 480 teraflops, which would equivalent to really of, of um, around 20,000 Raspberry Pis. You know, and now they're building pods, which are basically about 100 you know, petabytes, basically, of capability. And we'll come on to why that's actually important in terms of the machine learning context. Shortly. Um, <coughs> Google basically doesn't talk a lot about what they do. What we do know is they can classify over 100 million photos a day utilizing the, the machine learning capability. And I said I used to work for Dell Technologies. We were looking at this a couple of years ago. I think it's 2017, basically. Um, Intel basically in the skylight extended the, linear, extended the uh, aromatic sets. And this was the basis of Amazon C5 for machine learning. So we're starting to see really the start, the start of the commoditization of this. It really wasn't just about the power. It was basically about the fact that you could actually just go with your credit card and buy the, and utilize this. Um, but I also want to take you through some a, a slightly more practical context of this. Is anyone familiar with Fifi Lee's work? Anyone? No? So Fifi Lee is direct, called, co, was co-director of the Stanford AI and Vision Labs. And this is a quote from 2015. Is we want to, if we want to teach machines to think, we actually need to teach, teach them how to see first. So this is the practical bit. So I want to take you through just a simple case facial recognition and how this is actually done. Um, and of course, this has become hugely topical, not in the last year or so, and also probably in the last few weeks as well. I think the Scottish Parliament's looking at a monitorium on facial recognition because they're starting to see this is actually becoming too evasive actually in society. Um, and I wanted to take you through a couple of these things because algorithm, I, I heard earlier that this is not a data science, this is an algorithmic paradigm. And the fact that the algorithms are getting to the stage where actually they're becoming extremely efficient is actually one of the other things which actually is enabling us to realize the value of machine learning. Um, histograms. Histograms of Orientated Gradients for Detection, 2005. Uh, Fifi Lee's image data, data set was 2007, released in 2009. Uh, landmark detections we just touch on. But the big thing really was probably Google's FaceNet in 2015, because on the on a constrained data set, this was achieving something like over 99% recognition rates. On the YouTube, U, um, YouTube data feeds, it fell to about 95 um, and the fact that Google's FaceNet algorithms basically allow us to do it 
uh, you just treat it as an including space. So I don't need to have a classification mechanism in addition to that. It can do both um, identification, verification, and clustering. So basically, it can verify that I am who I am, you know, from taking a photo. Given a photo of, of, of Joe Bloggs, who it can do a comparison to determine who, who that photo belongs to. And the grouping or the clustering is quite interesting because you could take a photo of Brad Pitt and you could say, actually, who looks like Brad Pitt in our data sets? Um, and this is extremely efficient from an execution perspective. I'll just touch on three things, uh, some of these things. This was the 2004 paper around histograms of, uh, histograms of gradients. And what they found was basically fine orientation sampling called spatial sampling and st no strong normalization required. So what they, they do is they basically clump basically an image. And you take a series of cell, a cell which might be eight by eight in terms of pixel count, and then they'll block that actually up. So basically it might be 16 by 16. And you do that on a sliding window basis. So each cell contributes basically to multiple, basic, uh, multiple inputs into the block. And then you normalize that uh, and to, to generate the gradients. So it can be quite effective. This is just some simple code running on the laptop. The image on the left is not showing a high degree of contrast. You can see on the right it's defective the face image. Now, this is only one of many algorithms you could use for facial detection. But the key thing is you need to actually find the, the facial image to be able to extract it first. Um, hogs are quite useful if you've actually got a frontal. They're not useful, actually, if you've got an image which is actually side on. Um, I said that data uh, and the image, the Fifi Lee's work was quite instrumental in some of this stuff. Um, what she came up with, she realized that actually data was actually quite important to machine learning. Prior to 2009, the, the perception was data wasn't actually important. You just needed a more efficient algorithm. In fact, when she started this in 2007, she faced a lot of, a lot of um, you know, questions within her industry, basically asking about why are you doing this? Why we don't need larger data sets. But she, um, in a 2015 talk, she talked about the fact that most, you know, even the child by the age of three can differentiate between a cat and a dog. But if you, you know, humans actually take an image around about every 200 milliseconds when we blink. The child by the time they're three is probably seeing hundreds of millions basically of images. And we'll come back to that. It's quite critical. So she, she wanted to build basically a database of classified images to help the machine learning industry. Um, she started out actually doing this manually, um, paying her grad students about ten dollars an hour to do this. That didn't scale very well. It was actually only a chance um, conversation in the corridor. She came. Uh, she was told about the Amazon's mechanical trunk, which allows you to do piecemeal work. That enabled them to actually get a set of around three million and five thousand categories out in 2009 over about two years. And in 2010, they actually started a conversation, uh, competition associated with the Euro European uh, organization. And the interesting things that came out of this was um, that it started here, a huge range. The key is this data point here, 2012. This was actually AlexNet. This is um, Hilton's graduate um, students basically came up with an algorithm and a way of actually training the network. It was actually transformational. And we can then see basically what actually happened. It's more or less that's the topical, and they finished actually in about 2017 because no one, no one was. It was all within about five percent in terms of the detection rate. Um, when they finished it in 2017, they now actually have a database of over 13,000, sorry, 13 million categorized images, and that continues to grow. And what it's done is it's also set a precedent that basically this information is actually in the public domain and is actually quite important. Um, I said that basically you, need, you may need to actually manipulate images, landmarks. 2014 was a similar paper which improved this to around about a millisecond in terms of realization. It, I've just done this because it's, you, know, you might see things like NIS where they actually will bring the image up, they'll put, put an overlay onto that and then they'll play 
that's very much old school. That's not really what image, your facial imaging is around, recognition is around these days. But if you've got a facial, if you've done the success landmarks, then you can actually manipulate or you can move the image to, to enable you to crop, prove the accuracy over time. Um, but the big step forward was probably FaceNet in 2015 and what Google actually did with this. And it had several in interesting things. They actually used large data sets. Um, but the key thing was really that they were actually the training and training on very, very large data sets. They used this concept of a triplet. They actually had two positive, one negative. They had an anchor, a positive, and a negative. And the back propagation, what they were looking at doing was actually decreasing the distance between the anchor and the positive, increasing the distance between the anchor and the negative. And that, they, you know, the initial training sets were tens of millions, they actually got up to around 100 million in terms of the training set. And, but this point around the training hours, it was taking them, they didn't specify in the paper around the size of the clusters, but it was taking one to 2,000 hours to get those networks to a reasonable level. You know, that's 40, something, 81 days of training to get the network into a reasonable state, which is why the processing power has become quite, quite important. Um, but they note that even at the bottom there, there's you know, very interesting findings that, some, that this is somewhat surprising it works. Because what they're doing is you're actually, you, you're actually doing an embedding actually in the network, and then you're actually giving it a non, you know, outside that, it can still generate an encoding which actually is useful for you, which is um, representative of the individual mapping. Um, this is a very simple compilational network if you haven't come across them before. Um, this is actually AlexNet. And the reason I put this up is because it was one of the first ones, you know, it won the ImageNet in 2012. Very effective. Uh, the dense stuff on the right hand side, basically where it's a thousand basically outlets, what it's using is a softmax um, approach. So what it's looking at is converting the numbers actually into a probability distribution in which of the thousand categories you're actually interested. You've got two fully connected layers actually in there and then convolutional layers on the left hand side where you're actually similar to really what you do with the hog, you're defining a cell, you're looking across that and you, you're using that to actually define, the, extract the features actually out of the image that's coming in on the left hand side and enabling you to get the embedding. Um, you can see uh, one, one person was talking this morning really about the size of their networks and the number of combinations you get from this. So this is you know, quite by conventional standards probably a simple uh, compilation on your network and even that had some 60 odd million parameters. So the output of FaceNet basically is 128 byte array. 128, and that, that array it can be thought of as a hyperspace. It actually encodes any image that you actually put into the left-hand side that comes out. So we don't actually need to actually have a, have a separate classification like a support vector machine. We can actually just do simple including a mass actually to work out whether that image is correct. Um, and the point is, a lot of this is now very much in the public space. You don't need to have, have the training capability to do this. Open, OpenCV embeds the open face model, which is a pre-trained model, which has been trained with PyTorch. So you can effectively download this, put it on your laptop, put it on your, put it on your computer system, and play with it. So computer vision has got to the stage where basically it's probably very effective. Um, probably, you know, there is, seems to be some debate over human capability, but it's probably around 98 to 99% in terms of facial recognition. So in, in constrained cases, machine learning can actually probably match or actually exceed basically human capability now. And some of the large networks are starting to work with, you know, PPLE quotes of figures of something like 15 billion connections and 24 million nodes actually in, in the networks they're using. So the practical implications of this, you're starting to see it come out. You, know, you had the CEO of Google saying in 2017 that basically they're going to move from being mobile first to AI first. Um, the practical implications of this, you know, they built, the, built their capability over the last two decades nearly now because they started in the early 2000s. And the announcements of the Pixel 4 actually has a, has a 
has actually a neuro core actually now. And now we're actually working on, the, on some of the technology as well. The interesting thing about this was historically the, the networks you know, that were using internally were probably about 100 gigabytes. They've got the models down to about 100 megabytes, so they actually run on the phone. And they've actually jailbroken the code and actually got it running on other Android devices. So it's not necessarily tied to the neuro core actually on the Pixel 4s. So what we're getting, starting to see is actually what's being talked about is actually edge AI. So you can actually have this in your device and it can actually be effective. Uh, they've got two, two uh, apps actually on the phone, live capture. So anything coming through the device in terms of video stream could be live captured. And anything that you're actually recording in the environment, you can actually capture the text for in real time. Yeah. But I've talked about it being practical. Um, this is Pearl's take on causality from his book of why. And what, I'm, what's, what we can see is basically where we got to with machine learning is we're more or less just on the first rung of this ladder. We can do association, we can't do intervention, and we certainly can't do, do counterfactuals. His point is until you get to the level, level three in counterfactuals, machine systems won't be able to answer the question why. And the reason there's a little baby crawling up there is it points out that basically a child by the time they're three can actually differentiate counterfactuals. So the computer systems we have, machine learning at the moment, basically the way I would term it is they can manage data. You know, we've got the information, we can get knowledge. They can tell us the what, but they can't tell us the why at the moment. Um, Mug, I talked earlier about basically the definition of probably where we got to with AI as being actually quite quite narrow. Margaret Bowden is one of the, one of the old older people in terms of the AI community in the UK. She was uh, attended a talk of hers a couple of years ago. Her her view is that basically she will not see general AI in her lifetime, and she was very sceptical that we would see general AI in our lifetime at all. Um, but there is actually work going on basically to try and move machine learning from just an association somewhere up on the right hand side of this ladder. The question is, when will that actually be achieved? Um, we also have the situation, you know, one of the, what was touched on this morning um, around the bias issues. Fifi Lee talks about his bias in, bias out. And this is a classic example of what happened with Amazon. They were trying to use machine learning for basically recruitment. What the course they were doing was they were training it with a set of CVs for the last 10 years. Those t CVs were typically all male, and of course they typically selected male. So what they were finding was when they actually ran this over current CV applications, it was just selecting the males. So they actually ended up basically aborting the program and starting to see if they could pull it apart and actually utilize it again. So the training sets are actually quite important. Um, the philosopher Sharon Vella talks about the fact that there is no independent values. So this was sort of touched on this morning as well around some of the ethical things. The point is, it's our human values which are actually we're encoding actually in this. Um, and uh, the Haynes writing is actually quite interesting because her argument is that we are effectively codifying human biases actually into the system. We, have, we know we have cognitive biases. So what we're doing is we're creating machine systems that actually just reflect that. They do, you know, and this could, could actually lead to a lot of ethical issues down the road. So I think you know, they touched on this earlier this morning. I think this is a whole another area which AI actually has to address in time. So I said it was actually quite practical. I think there actually are huge implications and areas where machine learning can benefit us. A lot of them they were touching on was the fact around white collar. Um, the ones I'm sort of aware of is around the fish, um, suspicious activity and sanctions checking and payment processing. This has caused the banks over the last decade or so because of um, sanctions and counterterrorism a huge increase in headcounts because you know, the best algorithms up until probably about five years ago would, would round about 99.5, so it's around about potentially about 0.5 false positives. When you've got several tens of millions of accounts and you're getting a false positive rate of about 0.5, that's quite significant. And you can see that drove a lot of headcount into, into the payment processing space. There's now competitors coming out with machine learning which can move that to, to less. That's going to be a huge reduction in terms of headcount and, and better efficiency. 
Um, we've seen increased personalization as well. Um, one, of, one of the earlier talks was talking about this you know, Politic Pro in terms of basically publication. I think we're getting to the stage where you, know, you saw in the minority report where the individual walked into, the, into a shop. He was recognized from facial recognition and then basically asked about the products he'd, he'd previously bought. All that is actually probably going to be realizable within the next couple of years from a technology point of view. Um, you've seen Amazon Go out there. It's not quite there at the moment because you actually have to use your device to actually enable the system as you go in. And I suspect what they're doing is it's not purely facial recognition. It's a combination of space management and they've probably got RFID tags on the, device, on the actual you know, goods when you actually pick them up. But there is actually um, a trend report is talking about when Premier Football um, Soccer in your context club actually having a facial recognition system, replacing a ticketing system with facial recognition within the next couple of years. And I certainly think from a technology point of view that's actually going to be practical. So just starting to come back, I talked about the fact earlier that you know, we probably ended up with a narrow definition of AI and it's probably also shallow. But I think we've got to the stage where we've got basically the power and commoditization of compute. We've got efficiency. We've seen huge gains in efficiencies in the algorithms in the last five or 10 years. And we've actually also realized that the need for big data. You know. In hindsight, it's one, of, it's one of those obvious things because really what you're doing is this machine learning is an inductive process. It's going from, this, from one you know, few cases to the general. The more data you can put into this, actually, the better, the more robust the network's actually going to be and more capable, actually, capable. Um, so those things are actually coming to the stage. And I think one of the things around the big data, as I said earlier, Fifi Lee's observation was, you know, we take an image every 200 milliseconds, so a child by the age of three has probably seen a few hundred million images is what's the size of the data set we actually need to actually be reasonably and not be overtrained um, our models. If you're, more, if you're interested in sort of exploring the space, a couple of things uh, around fast AI. I, love, I like the strap line, but the strap line is more around the fact that you don't need to do this on, on Linux, you can do it on Windows, and you don't need the large data sets that Google had. But you know, given some of the comments I've just said around the data sets and necessary to support the training, um, that's possibly debatable. The Coursera stuff, Andrew Ning's courses are really good, the Stanford courses. Um, we used to require the pivotal data scientists to actually have to done, his, done his training course as part of their, actually their, um, part of their training. Um, so, I'm going to ask you for any questions. Their challenge was they couldn't because the, the CV sets they actually had were predominantly male. So inherently the data set actually was biased. So you know, you, this was touched on earlier. That, um, you're going to actually either have to come up with a way of actually uh, generating training sets. And this is one of the innovations they've done in the image space. So to actually generate the, the size, they've actually manipulated the, manipulated the images to generate effectively additional training. Now the point would be, can we actually go back and actually you know, generate tra sets of training which we think actually have the right sort of character and, and exhibit the diversity actually we're, we're, we're trying to look for? Okay, we're and then that's the follow-up question I have is in the training sets, can we remove those attributes to remove the bias? I don't see how you can remove those, no. those attributes. Yeah, the attributes are quite important. It's, it's actually making sure you have the diversity in the training set is going to be the challenge. Yes, 
So how, how can we use the examples? Um, the previous um, presenters are in here they were talking about how they actually saw some of the AI stuff coming, uh, specifically things like natural language. You know, so the capability basically for the system to actually understand you and actually start doing the query processing. So not actually having a structured, structured query interfaces, but natural language. Um, we were playing around with that about 30 years ago. The problem we actually had was actually that it was tied to some, some system. So I think you know, what we're starting to see is the technology and the algorithms are catching up. So you can start doing this, and you can start utilizing it with your knowledge, your, your knowledge programs. So if you look at, um, I wanted to make sure everybody knows that the slides for all these presentations are going to be on the KM World website. So in answer to that question, I would say, too, look at the, look at the slides for um, Track A 102 speakers, because they have, they have some of that in there. And those slides were very much around, the, these are the areas they actually wanted to start exploring. They didn't actually have initiatives, but it was areas which they, they saw the overlap. Areas of promise. Yes. Yeah. 